Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you today. Um, I just wanted to make one small correction. So recently, in October, I actually joined Stanford University. Yeah, so I'm an associate professor of pediatric infectious diseases at Stanford University in California in the United States. So I'm very happy to be here. I wanted to thank St. George's University and WinRef and the Ministry of Health for inviting me to come and speak with you on Chick and Grenada and um, looking forward to see what we're really in for, for both dengue and chikungunya. So my lecture, I'm going to talk briefly about arboviruses in general and the vectors that carry them. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on dengue fever and then move on and spend most of the time on chikungunya fever, the spread and the symptoms. I'm going to spend some time talking about the consequences of disease, what we can do for disease control and prevention, specific challenges for Grenada, and then a planned research project here in Grenada. So first, what are arboviruses? So arbovirus stands for arthropod-borne virus. These are viruses that require a blood-sucking arthropod to complete their life cycle. Many of these infections um, infect animals and human populations, so we call them zoonotic, and we know of at least 500 viruses. There are, there are eight viral families that these viruses come from, but there are three in particular that cause most of the human disease the Togaviridae, the Flaviviridae, and the Bunyaviridae. Chikungunya is a Togavirus, and dengue is a Flavivirus. In order to really understand a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, I think it's important to start with life cycles. So first we're going to look at chikungunya. So chikungunya operates first and foremost in a sylvatic cycle. So sylvatic means that it involves primates, and, and vector populations, vector mosquitoes. So usually in the jungles of Africa where chick was um, originally found, there are these non-human primates that are infected by different jungle mosquitoes, and they go on, go on to develop virus and then infect new mosquitoes, and the cycle continues. And every once in a while, the cycle um, um, bleeds over into human populations, and there's this urban chikungunya cycle that involves humans, and then 80s aegypti and 80s albopictus mosquitoes. Human, humans, and unfortunately, get very, get very sick with chicken, which, which, which I'll talk about, about and they get very, very high, high, high virus, virus in their blood. So that, so that allows an infected mosquito to bite, bite them, and they come and become infected and spread the infection to human humans. humans. So we so alone, alone continue, continue the cycle, the cycle chicken without, chicken without, without feeding, feeding from the sylvatic cycle. As for dengue, dengue, dengue looks a lot like the chikungunya life cycle. So, so sometime in evolutionary past there was that exact with dengue. But in the more recent, 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 recent past, and in the outbreaks that have been occurring for the last 50 years or so, it's really all about the urban cycle of dengue. Again, 80s Egypti mosquitoes and human populations that get sick enough to allow um, us to infect uninfected mosquitoes and then continue this cycle. So for many of you in the audience, I'm sure you know this, but I like to point out that there are many different types of mosquitoes that spread these different viral infections and other infections in the world. So the ones we're going to focus on tonight are 80s mosquitoes, the 80 species mosquitoes. And these mosquitoes look like this. They have these um, beautiful little white and black stripes, and they feed during the daytime. Now compare that to Anopheles mosquitoes, which I think many of you know is the malaria vector. So these are the mosquitoes that spread malaria, and they actually feed after dark, when it's nighttime. And so that's why a mosquito net is very helpful to protect against malaria, because that's when those mosquitoes feed. But those mosquito nets are not that helpful for these day-biting mosquitoes, such as Aedes. And then there are other mosquitoes that I'm not going to talk about today, like Culex mosquitoes, which spread things like lymphatic filariasis and West Nile virus, which is another arbovirus, and they actually feed at dawn and dusk. So you can see it's important to know what type of vectors you have in your area, because it's important to know for control and also what they might be spreading. But then it's also important to know what infections you have in your area so that you know what vectors you might have so that you can go about um, targeting control for the different types of vector species. So the vector that we're going to spend most of the time talking and discussing tonight is Aedes aegypti. So here it is again, this um, little black and white mosquito. And um, the, th the thing about Aedes aegypti mosquitoes is that they've really sort of evolved to really be very efficient transmitter of diseases to humans. And there's several different reasons for this. One is that Aedes is a very nervous feeder. So it will start to feed on a person, a, 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 like a female mosquito who's looking for a blood meal to complete 
her cycle to lay her eggs. She'll start to feed on one person. If that person moves a little bit, she'll jump to another person. And it takes maybe three, four, five people before she actually fills up on the blood meal to get enough blood to make her eggs. And so that nervous feeding and that nervous behavior actually makes her a very efficient spreader of disease because one mosquito can infect many people. It takes about 13 days or so for, for ADs to go through this cycle from eggs through larvae, pupae, and into adults. And the eggs themselves are quite hardy, and they can remain viable even in dry areas for over a year. They fly about 100 meters or so, and the most important thing is that they love to, um, to breed peridomestically. They're container breeders, so it takes about only a tablespoon of water in and around a home to allow these mosquitoes to actually start to breed. And they really prefer to feed on people than animals. They're amphiphilic. They love to live in and around human habitats. So it can be very difficult when you're trying to control them. There was a, a study done in Grenada um, and published in 2005 that actually showed that there, in the homes that were surveyed as part of this study, 96% of those homes actually stored fresh water in containers, and over 50% actually had the, the larvae of Aedes aegypti in the water containers on the property, and 92% actually had adult Aedes aegypti mosquitoes within the homes. So you can see that this mosquito has done a good job of making Grenada a good habitat for itself. So are these infections important? Over every year, there's over a million people who die from mosquito-borne viral infections. And I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician, so I care quite a bit about the children. And children are actually at very high risk because they often suffer a lot of mosquito bites because they're outside. These infections, as we've probably seen here in, in recent months, can really spread widely throughout communities, and there can be substantial health impact and health costs because of them. And they're globally distributed. These are problems all over the world, but they are limited by vector range. I like to point out that arboviruses are actually neglected diseases. Neglected diseases, the neglected tropical diseases are a group of, of tropical infectious diseases that occur in developing and developed nations that are poverty promoting and long lasting. So arboviruses in particular can infect impoverished more severely and actually promote poverty by these long standing health consequences that we're gonna discuss this evening. Now, over the last 20 years or so, we've seen a great resurgence in these types of, of outbreaks. And this has happened in human and animal populations. These outbreaks have been caused by viruses which were thought to be under control, such as dengue or yellow fever, and other viruses that have expanded their geographies, such as West Nile or Rift Valley fever or chikungunya. And it's possible that some of these outbreaks have been caused by new viruses. When you look at what's been causing the outbreaks for decades, in fact, and with that comes a lot of these vectors and then therefore promote the diseases they carry. Change, all of these. And this is for only 50 to 100 million infections per year, but more recently, some accurate estimates have come out, again, showing about 400 million infections of dengue per year. And with dengue, it's important to know that only about a quarter of infections, about 25% of people who get infected actually show signs from the disease. So there are a lot of infections that occur in people with no symptoms. So we think that there's 400 million dengue infections per year, but only about 100 million of those actually manifest symptomatically, apparently, with symptoms in people. Overall, there's about 55 million cases per year in the Americas, and Grenada is no stranger to dengue. So you all know that dengue virus is endemic here in Grenada. And um, in the 50s, it was prevalent in the major coastal towns, with a few cases in the smaller coastal communities. And it's really waxed and waned, the dengue prevalence. In 95, there was a dengue outbreak because dengue 1 was introduced, and there was one case of hemorrhagic fever. And then it sort of laid low for four years until 1999, when dengue 3 came. And so um, that caused over about 300 cases that were documented, probably many more, and three cases of hemorrhagic fever. And um, more punishment of a dengue fever. This is a CDC map from 2008 the areas at risk for chikungunya. And you can see we're not on that. But um, so this was, the, again, the tropical world, living between the 10 degree isotherms because it's the same vectors as dengue. And you can see that this is the imported cases of chick, all these little um, purple spots. And you can see that chikungunya, of course, has been reported in many places. It gets imported when people get sick in the tropics and then come home. 
So the name chikungunya means that which bends up in the Makande language, and that refers to the stoop prostor that one gets from the arthritis and the back pain when they're sick with the disease. The first recognized outbreak of chick occurred in East Africa in the 1950s, but as you can see by this long list here, it has spread all throughout Southeast Asia and Africa with many, many outbreaks. And in both Africa and Asia, reemergence was really unpredictable. You never knew when you were going to have a bad chick year in the intervals, with intervals of maybe 7 to 20 years between outbreaks. So the signs and symptoms of chikungunya look a lot like those of dengue. So two to five days after an infected 80s bite, you can have abrupt onset of very high fever again, up to 40. You can have a particular macular papular rash that's just a red rash on your trunk or extremities. Arthralgia and arthritis, so you get swelling and pain of the joints, which is usually symmetric. Headaches, red eyes, photophobia can also occur. And the fever actually is pretty short-lived. It's only for a few days at the beginning of the illness. But feeling sick, the prostration and the headaches can last for about a week or so. And then unfortunately, the joint symptoms usually last quite a bit and go away and then come back and come back and come back. Can I get a... Uh-huh, yeah. All right. So these are the examples quite common sort of in the central nervous system, in the spinal, um, the eye of the hands and the feet, which can cause been a few studies on this. In South Africa, which this was a study done um, several years ago, about 12 to 18 percent of patients had persistent symptoms at about a year and a half, and even up to two or three years later. Unfortunately, the more recent studies have shown higher numbers. So in the India outbreak in 2006, about 50% of people had symptoms at 10 months. And then in the most recent outbreaks, La Reunion outbreaks, um, 80 to 90% of patients complained of persistent symptoms at three months, and that dwindled down to 60% at 15 months, but still nearly 50% of people were still having pains in their joints at two years. So it can last quite a long time. This is a picture of um, swollen, painful, stiff hands in a gentleman who was infected five years before this picture was taken. I want to tell the story of how Chick first traveled down the in, um, traveled and, and spread across Southeast Asia and, and, um, and Europe, and then I'll talk about the Caribbean spread. So in 2004, there was a large um, Chick outbreak that sort of spread down the, um, the East African coast and landed in the Indian Ocean Islands. And this is a favorite vacation spot for many European vacationers. And so what happened was that they, they traveled there and they picked up chikungunya on their vacation and then they brought it back with them into Europe. And so there were many, many um, publications about the, the problems that people were having during that, that importation, but it was just imported cases. Then chick, the, um, the virus went from the Indian Ocean Islands into India in 2006. And India has had chikungunya outbreaks for a long, long time, many, many times. But they noticed during this outbreak that the virus just seemed to be more severe. People seemed to be more sick. They noticed that the, the mortality rates in different communities were going up. And then the virus traveled from India into Europe, into, into Italy. And so many people were confused how this virus could get to Italy, and then it started spreading in Italy. So there was octocthenous spread, and what that means is local spread by local mosquitoes. So not just imported cases, but actually spread among the mosquitoes in Italy. And there are a lot of Aedes albopictus mosquitoes all throughout southern Europe. And so a lot of studies were done, and what was found was that the virus made a, a, had a mutation. So its nucleic acid changed by one base pair, and this allowed it to actually survive better in the Italian mosquito, this 80s albopictus mosquito, and it increased its virulence. So that sort of explains why the disease seemed more severe than what had previously happened in India, and then why it was spreading so well in, in Italy. And this mosquito, much like 80s aegypti, it looks a lot like 80s aegypti. I can't tell them apart, but I'm not an entomologist. Um, but they're, again, black and white striped. And this, these are maps just showing the spread of this mosquito. So you can see the darker shades indicate greater numbers for suitable habitat for these 80s albopictus mosquitoes. And you can see here in Grenada, they're also um, wildly rampant here. So 
this is just a little joke, but this, this is a, gear, um, a, a Far Side comic, and it says, wow, you're from Italy, you have beautiful eyes, and he's harboring a virus in his bloodstream, and the virus is saying, hey, everyone, we're going to Rome. And I put this up here to say, this is exactly how viruses travel the world. It's not so much that the mosquitoes get on the airplanes or they get transported or they fly across the islands. It's that people get sick with the virus and they carry the virus with them on the airplanes into new places. And in those new places, all the vectors are there just waiting to have a taste of the new pathogen in that person's blood. And that's how these, these things spread throughout the world. So this was just the paper showing this, the single mutation that allowed this, mis this virus to now transmit so easily in this um, very, very common mosquito in South Europe. And it's actually in many, many places in the world. I want to bring up um, that chikungunya has three genotypes. So there's three different flavors of chikungunya. There's the East Central South African genotype, there's the Asian genotype, and there's the West African genotype. And when this outbreak happened down the coast of, of Kenya and Africa and then in the Indian Ocean Islands, they found out that the, the virus was actually this East Central South African genotype of the virus. So remember that, because we'll come to that later. When I boarded my plane to come here two days ago, this is what met me, this placard met me at the airport. So were you re recently in the Caribbean? You know, you may be harboring chikungunya and dengue and to watch for fever and call my doctor if I get sick. So let's talk a little bit about what's been going on with this most recent outbreak of chikungunya here. So in no mid-November of last year, there were five patients without any travel history who presented to a healthcare facility in St. Martin that looked like they had dengue, except they had a little bit more joint pain than what was usual. So severe arthralgias, but sort of a dengue-like episode. And so what happened was, was that then an entomological and epidemiological investigation of these cases began on November 22nd. And then by the 26th of November, there was this French National Reference Center alert, and the samples were sent. Just a week later or so, the analysis was done. They did a serology, and we'll talk about this, and PCR, polymerase chain reaction testing, and they detected recent alphavirus infection. And a couple of days later, it was found out that it was chikungunya, and chick emergence was confirmed. And then they further genotyped the virus, and they found that it belonged to the Asian genotype, not the East Central South African genotype. So not the mutated strain that grows so well in the Aedes albopictus mosquito, but the regular old chikungunya that loves Aedes aegypti. And this is just an epidemic curve of the first cases. So in October, there was a confirmed case and it sort of dwindled down all the way through December. And you can see um, all of the other French islands started to show cases in December also. And th again, they placed this virus, it was um, in the Asian genotype closest to some Philippine and Chinese strains of chikungunya. So now I'm just gonna take you through some maps showing the outbreak in the Caribbean here. As you can see, this was a map released a few, I think about a week ago or so, just showing all of the countries that now have chikungunya. Um, imported cases are in lighter purple, and then the dark ones are the ones that have locally transmitted cases. You can see the whole Caribbean is dark. So first in December, again, we had the outbreak in St. Martin, then Guadalupe, Martinique, Guiana, making its way to South America quite quickly. And then in January, there was St. Barthélemy, and then the British Virgin Islands, Dominica, Aruba, French Guiana, and then Anguilla, St. Kitts, St. Lucia, a close neighbor to you guys, Dominican Republic, St. Vincent, even closer, Haiti, and Puerto Rico, and Brazil having huge outbreaks in May, and then Grenada. So now I know that I actually got to meet the physician who diagnosed the first cases in Caracou um, in early July or so about that time. Um, but I put here August 15th. I'm not exactly sure when the first cases really hit the main island of Grenada, but I guessed maybe it was about mid-August or so. And I just bring this up just to show you what's going on in the U.S., where I'm from. So Florida, of course, has a lot of, a lot of interaction with the Caribbean, and so we always get a lot of imported cases of things from the Caribbean into Florida. So this isn't shocking that, of course, the first cases were diagnosed in Florida. But you can see right after, there were imported cases all across the nation. And as the weeks went by, more and more imported cases in more and more states in the U.S. 
So pick your favorite state. You can see it up there, and it's, it's being, you have imported chikungunya. But then, July 17th, locally transmitted cases in Florida. So this is a big deal because there are a lot of mosquitoes in Florida, a lot of Aedes albopictus, a lot of Aegypti. And so now Florida is in red because those are the octoxinous cases, the locally transmitted cases. And for now, it seems as we go through further weeks that although most of the states are seeing imported cases, we aren't having any other local transmission except for Florida. But there are ongoing studies now in Texas because often in the border towns of Texas, we have local transmission of dengue, so it's possible and likely that we'll have local transmission of chikungunya in Texas also. And this is just a graphic just showing the cases. So the first imported cases were in May that were documented in Florida, and those cases rose, continue to rise. Um, and the red cases, we just have a steady, a steady little bit that's due to locally acquired cases. But the new cases continue to occur. This is just a week ago, and we continue to have you know, 145 imported cases each week. So this, these are just a listing of the countries where chikungunya cases have been reported, and then the territories and countries where it's been reported. So you can see um, just much of South America and, um, and Central America and the Caribbean has, has been exposed and has reported cases. And so this is the new map now. Remember the old map I showed you of chikungunya just with Africa and Southeast Asia? This is the new map just showing all of the local transmission all across the world. So it definitely has emerged and re-emerged again. I want to bring up the life cycle once more to you just to, to make one point. So I mentioned at the beginning that there's this sylvatic, this monkey cycle of chikungunya, and then there's the urban cycle, and it's thought that the monkey cycle sort of feeds into the urban cycle. While there are a lot of monkeys, in the New World, in South America, in the Caribbean. I know about the Mona monkey here in Grenada. I don't know how these monkeys are going to um, impact either transmission to humans or the viral changes, viral evolution. So there's a lot of unanswered questions about these primates and if, if they're going to at all impact the human cycle of chikungunya here in the New World. So now on to diagnosis. How do we diagnose this disease? Well, most arboviral infections really present in just a few ways in humans. You know, most of the time, there's just febrile illness, sort of nonspecific febrile illness. There's the brain infection that I told you about, which can sometimes happen in a, in a small minority, meningoencephalitis. And then some viruses can cause a hemorrhagic fever. But if you rely just on clinical diagnosis alone, there's a lot of overlapping symptoms. So it's, it's very difficult to do that. You really need good diagnostics. Um, usually these infections are sort of biphasic, so initially they're sort of mild and they can get severe, just like dengue starts off mild and then day three, usually that's when you're going to get severe. Um, and it's confusing because if you're just using clinical diagnosis, you know, the, one virus can present in many different ways in different people and then different viruses can present the same. So it's really hard to rely just on clinical acumen to make a, a diagnosis of these diseases. This is a listing just showing the differential diagnosis of chikungunya. So where I work in Kenya, malaria is top on the list as um, the, um, the number one cause of acute febrile illness and what most people are thinking about when they see a child or an adult who's sick with fever there. Here, luckily, you don't have any malaria, but you do have dengue, and we have leptospirosis here. And so that can be confusing, too, because, again, chikungunya and dengue or lepto, they look a lot alike. How do we diagnose this? Usually we have to rely on serology, so we rely on the human immune response to these viruses. Our body is making the antibody and then us detecting the antibody in the lab to really diagnose the infection. You can diagnose the antibody in the bloodstream. You can also diagnose it in the, the fluid that bathes the brain if you have a severe brain case of this disease. Usually there's two different types of antibody we look at. There's IgM, which is the early antibody, and then there's IgG, which is the later antibody that persists for years. IgM usually comes up about three to eight days after you begin to be ill, whereas IgG, it takes a little bit longer to come up, but then it stays positive for life. Unfortunately, um, you can sometimes use what's called convalescent titers, which is a, um, a, you get an IgG antibody test done right when a person's sick, and then you wait at least two weeks and you take another blood sample to try and see an increase in their IgG response to diagnose these infections. But unfortunately, that can be difficult to do because sometimes you can't get those paired blood specimens. If you rely on serology, there's actually a lot of cross-reaction with these tests. So like viruses can sometimes 
give you false positive reactions on these tests. For instance, if you've had a yellow fever vaccination, do a dengue um, IgG test, it will look positive because you've had a yellow fever vaccination, and yellow fever and dengue are the same type of, they're in the same family of viruses. So unfortunately, you have to do what's called plaque reduction neutralization tests, which are confirmatory tests, but they're very labor intensive, they're very expensive, and they can only happen in specialized laboratories. The, a, a, also need the IgM testing later on to get those who come to care a little bit later. So this just shows a diagnostic strategy in the first few days of illness. Again, you can try and isolate the virus or do PCR. Days four to eight, you can do PCR and IgM. Hopefully your IgM will be positive. And then if it's been more than a week or so, PCR will not work. The virus is gone. And so you just look for the human immune response to, to the virus by serology testing. So there's a great need, actually, for better diagnostics for these infections. As I mentioned, there's really not a lot of specificity between assays. There's that cross-reaction between viruses that are related. And so you really need, we need better assays that, ha that are more specific for each different virus so we don't get those false positives. Culture, unfortunately, is difficult to do. As I mentioned, a lot of um, are special. For instance, chikungunya is a biosafety level three virus. So, um, you need a lot of special precautions in the laboratory so that you don't transmit it to laboratory personnel. Um, PCR, I mentioned, have low sensitivity, especially if a person's coming to care late. And that goal should really be really cheap, rapid detection on site in communities, in the local hospitals, the district hospitals are lower than that even. And that's really to uncover the burden of disease, to identify the vectors. Um, in children, we don't really know, um, we don't have accurate estimates of disease burden, how often children are getting infected, but we know that children of all ages are at risk, even those in utero, so in their mother's wombs, are, are at risk for infection. If a pregnant mother is infected with chikungunya, for instance, in her third trimester, there's a, especially late in the third trimester, there's a risk there for the baby, that the baby when the baby um, is born. Uh, have all the studies about the long-term effects in children. We don't know about if it's affecting cognition, if they're having ocular problems, and so forth. So really recognition of these long-term consequences. The Action of Disease Project, what this is, is it's a, it's a project where they're trying to compare all the diseases, of so both communicable and non-communicable diseases, to try and give them sort of a rating of how bad are they. And they And when they did the initial GBD, they forgot to include arboviruses in it at all. And so we got sort of mad. So we decided to do a little GBD project of our own where we looked at um, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, chikungunya, and Rifali fever to try and estimate how much of the world was really suffering from these infections. And what we found was that up to about 5 million years of healthy life were lost each year due to these infections. And that's because it wasn't the, you know, just the week long of fever missing work. Really what it was was that the early mortality that these infections can cause and then also those long standing medical consequences, the chronic conditions, the arthritis and so forth, um, that really costs the, the, the healthy life years lost. Unfortunately, the data here is very scanty. We really have very little data about burden of disease and, and how these, these infections are really affecting populations. But we know that they're generally severely underestimated in the world, so more, more work needs to be done. So how do we prevent these infections? How do you prevent chikungunya? I'm sure you guys have all heard this, but really you can only prevent chikungunya um, um, by preventing the bite of an, a mosquito, right? To, to not be bitten by these infected mosquitoes. So how do we do that? Well. Repellent is a good way. DEET's the most effective repellent. Up to about 30% is safe. You can use it in children two months and older. It's absorbed systemically, and it does cross the placenta, but again, it's thought to be safe. Picaridin's another repellent, which is supposedly as effective as DEET. You can also spray your clothes with permethrin to try and repel mosquitoes that way. And then, of course, all of these infections can be, be spread by blood transfusions, so it's important to screen blood. It's just another little joke. So, um, you know, in the where I am in California, it's sort of um, there's a place that a lot of people like natural things, like mystic herbal balms and such, to try to prevent mosquitoes. So you can see this guy from Greenpeace here is screaming for a very uh, 
toxic chemical, right? So it's, repellent is, is a really good way to prevent bites from mosquitoes. Not everyone wants to wear it all the time. You know, people worry about long-term effects. But for now, and I'm going to bring up some other, other ways that you can clean your households to try to, to prevent the mosquitoes from using your household as a very effective habitat to transmit disease. But other than repellent, there's not much more we can do right now. But in the future, there are some alternative approaches. So recently, there have been, um, there's been a release of insects that carry a dominant lethal gene. It's called riddle technology. And so what this is is the mosquitoes, after they breed, after a few generations, only male mosquitoes are, are made. And so, of course, female mosquitoes are the ones that are blood-seeking, that are trying to, you know, get the blood for protein to make their young. And so only having male mosquitoes would then, uh, you know, kill off the, those mosquito species. Another alternative is something called Wolbachia. So Wolbachia is an intracellular bacterium, and it's been shown that mosquitoes infected with this bacteria actually are worse transmitters of disease. So there was this paper that showed that um, mosquitoes that were infected, infected with Wolbachia did not transmit chikungunya or yellow fever viruses as well as the uninfected mosquitoes by quite a bit. So this could be another possibility of ways that we can, you know, introduce Wolbachia into mosquito populations to try and decrease their ability to transmit these different viral infections. And then, of course, you know, the holy grail, the vaccine. There are many, 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 many people working on chikungunya vaccines right now. They're in early phases, phase one trials, some of them. And so um, I think in time, chikungunya is, is behind dengue, but in time there will be a chikungunya vaccine. This is a slide showing what happens when you delay uh, vector surveillance and vector control in these arboviral infections. What we're looking at here, this is data from 2003 in these upper panels and then 2009 in these lower panels. And we're looking at human cases of disease here and then the millions of dollars that it costs to, to stop the outbreak. And the, the green bar is what usually happens, which is about four you know, four to six weeks, um, you actually, in, within four to six weeks of the mosquito virus actually starting to, to um, present itself in your community, you actually do the surveillance and you find that within that time frame, about four to six weeks. And this is the usual of what usually happens. But if you were to delay by just two weeks, that's, that's these red bars. You can see that that short delay of just two weeks, because maybe you weren't ongoing on surveillance, surveillance or so forth, results in an exponential, in an exponential increase in both the human cases and the millions of dollars, dollars that it costs to um, abort, um, abort the outbreak. outbreak. So really, so really active surveillance, surveillance, surveillance actions is really, 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 really crucial. crucial. And it's important, and it's important really to really prevent the risk of risk instead of waiting until an outbreak occurs, because, because then it's, it's very difficult, it's very difficult, difficult to kill off all, all of those adult mosquitoes. So what are the particular challenges of Grenada? Well, you know, for chicken junia in particular, it was a non-immune population. Right? So no one had ever seen chikungunya before. So when the virus hit here, everyone got chikungunya, or most people did. Um, unfortunately, there's, a, there's widespread competent mosquito vectors. So again, there's Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus on the island. And so when that happens, then of course those, those vectors get infected and then spread to uninfected people. Um, right now, we don't really have any on-site chikungunya dengue virus. And so they went off and they did a study to sort of see if they could use case definitions of chikungunya and dengue and see if they could diagnose these infections at the same time during an outbreak. They did standard testing, which was just PCR testing, and then also serology. And what they found in their outbreak was, this was their outbreak, so there was a ton of chikungunya, as you'd expect, but then you can see these light blue bars down here. There was also dengue being transmitted. And if you blow up um, this part of the, the graphic, you can see here, you know, maybe spreading. And the last large outbreak, so they're the only susceptibles in the population, usually, right? Because they haven't been old enough, they haven't seen it yet. So these were mainly children. And then there was this pre-epidemic phase where more people were getting infected, and then there was the outbreak, right, of, of um, dengue 3 in 2002. And so, you know, chikungunya probably looked a lot like this with the outbreak. And um, I think that transmission will continue to occur. I think it seems like right now it seems to be on the decline here. I don't know if, ever, if people, maybe it's starting to peter out. We're probably in the, the curve here. Dry up a little. Just showed you. It's going to continue to occur probably forever. Just like.
because hospital led tested. Positive, it seems like many people because 25 percent are of so so getting infected with dengue, but they're just 97 percent of. Um, and so this project, if it comes to be, will be trapping mosquito vectors and testing for the virus, looking for hot spots of transmission on the island to, to intervene in those areas. We'll be doing community surveys to identify the spectrum of human disease, both in the communities themselves and then also in different hospitals and clinics. And then we're going to be following people up to identify the consequences of chick and dengue and really see why some people you know, stay with, with the disease so long or have these horrible relapses of the joint disease. There'll be some virus sequencing and immune response evaluation to really understand why some people get very sick with it. And then we'll be developing on-site testing at St. George's, at the Ministry of Health Hospitals, and then also Windref. And then do some educational interventions to again educate on the importance of chick and what you can do to sort of prevent these mosquito bites. So again, diagnostics and therapy because they cause not only short-term disease but these long-term health consequences. And we don't really understand the true economic or health impact of these infections because no one's really following them up to see what's still happening years out. We need to really optimize epidemic vector-borne disease control, and we haven't figured that out yet. You know, chikungunya has caused explosive outbreaks in every year that were particular for research people, but they worked incredibly hard, and it wasn't going to work, but I visited some song, but it was amazing. There's a lot of questions, and they got almost all of them correct.